Better System Trader, episode 63. Welcome to Better System Trader, the podcast to help systematic traders of all levels improve their trading. We'll give you loads of expert tips and practical advice on system design and validation, money management, trading psychology, and many other topics. Whether you're just starting out or a savvy systematic trader, we're here to help you improve your trading and find more success. This is Better System Trader with your host, Andrew Swanscott. All right, welcome back to the Better System Trader podcast. It's really great to have you here and thanks a lot for joining us. My name is Andrew Swanscott and this is episode 63 and we've got another really great episode for you here today. So I'm really excited to be sharing it with you. But first, I'd just like to say a big thank you for all the great feedback that we received on the previous episode, which was about mean reversion with PJ Sutherland. We received a lot of really positive emails on that one, a few even suggested that it could have been the best episode yet, and I even had some trend followers emailing me saying that that episode had inspired them to look into mean reversion trading. So for those of you that haven't heard it yet, I do recommend you have a listen to that. Even if mean reversion isn't your particular style of trading, there are a lot of gems of wisdom that PJ shared with us in there um, that can apply to all traders. So go check that one out. It's highly recommended. And now on to this episode. I think we can probably all agree that most trading strategies have an optimal type of market condition where they perform at their absolute best. So having an understanding of market conditions and being able to detect and adapt to them can really have a huge impact on trading performance. But how can we actually measure market regimes properly? What techniques can we use to find that delicate balance between stability and reactivity so that it actually improves performance rather than reduces it? Our guest for this episode, Alan Clement, has completed considerable research into market regimes and is going to share his knowledge with us today, which is great. Alan is a certified financial technician, full-time independent trader, quantitative trading systems designer, and a private investment consultant. In this episode, Alan is going to share what market regimes are and how they can impact the performance of trading strategies, the different types of market regimes and key aspects that we need to consider when we're defining them, and a number of techniques that can be used for market regimes, including indicators, market breadth, and intermarket measures, plus some of the advantages and challenges with these techniques. Now, Alan is going to share a lot of information today, so if you have a pen or pencil handy, you may want to get it ready. If not, you can always come back to it later. But before we get started, a quick message from our sponsor, TradingMarketInternals.com. If you're looking for a proven solution to slashing drawdowns, adapting quickly to changing market conditions and improving overall trading strategy performance, then download the free Market Internals online starter kit right now before it disappears. You can get it for absolutely free at tradingmarketinternals.com or check the show notes page for more details at bettersystemtrader.com slash 63. And now on to our chat with Alan Clement on market regimes. Hi Alan, thanks for joining us today. It's really great to have you back on the show. Thanks, Andrew, and thanks very much for the invite. I know you've not had many guests back, so it really is an honour to to uh, have the to, to be asked back and to have the opportunity to, to share something uh, different this time. Yeah, so your first appearance on the podcast was way back in episode twenty nine, which is I think probably more than a year ago now. And um, you know, back in that episode, we covered um, a couple of topics: uh, rotational trading, drawdown position sizing and also some stuff on system health. So there was a wide variety of topics back then, but um, in this episode, we will be focusing on just one topic, which should be cool. Now, the the idea for this podcast episode came from the IFTA conference, which was held in uh, Sydney in October. And uh, at the conference, you presented some interesting research on market filters or market regimes. So um, today, we're really going to dive um, deeper into that topic and um, and really explore that further. But before we do get started, do you want to just give us a little bit of background on yourself? 
Uh, sure thing. Yes. Yeah. So my professional background was actually in the financial industry. I worked in investment management and also with uh, a top tier investment bank in the city of London for, for many years, uh, primarily in the software development, IT space, uh, in, uh, mostly left the corporate world about 15 years ago and decided I was going to have a go at uh, becoming an independent trader. I was I did the usual thing that everybody went, you know, chased holy grails and tried every indicator on earth and uh, and really didn't sort of get anything that I could sort of uh, find that would work consistently and and it wasn't really until I came across the works of uh, Howard Bandy that someone introduced me to that things really sort of started to to bed in for me and I was lucky enough to to uh, go and study and meet Howard a, a number of times as well and he, he really was an inspiration and that kind of sent me down the path of uh, of the quantitative uh, route to to strategy development so and I guess coming from a software development background that kind of helped uh, when it came to the coding side of things so 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 I started developing and designing my own strategies and that's really what turned me into a consistently profitable trader and I've continued on that path uh, you know I've been doing it full you know full time basically for the last 15 years or so uh, <laughs> lately or last few years I've started to do talks on uh, technical analysis and quantitative development to uh, investment groups both here and overseas and things like the uh, the IFTA conference that uh, you saw me at recently yep. uh, and I've also d- done a bit of uh, consultancy and mentoring to p- both private and institutional uh, traders Yep. Okay, cool. Thanks for sharing that, Alan. Now, as um, as I mentioned before, we'll be discussing market regime or market filters today. So how about we start with uh, the basics and how would you define a market regime or a market filter? Sure. Yeah. Well, my definition of market regime is is the state of the market. You know, what what state of the market is in, and and when I talk about market, that could be you know it could be an individual instrument, a stock or a commodity or a, or a foreign exchange pair, or it could be a, a sector of stocks, or it could be a whole index. Uh, so you know, depending on what market you're focusing on, will be where you want to detect what the market regime is for that. And when we talk about market regime, we're talking about you know what state is the market conditions in, and those can be divided into probably three pairs in my book we want to find out probably is the market bullish or bearish we want to find out is the market volatile or is it calm uh, or is the market tr- in a trending state or a non-trending or congesting state uh, and, and those are the kinds of things we're looking for and it depends what your uh, w- what your overall strategy is trying to target as to which uh, one of those that you'll use to to try and do the detection yeah. Okay. So, why do you think it's important to have a market regime filter in um, in your trading strategies? Well, when it comes to trading strategies, what what you'll find with most strategies is they they um, they perform best in certain market conditions. So, for example, at a, a, a a momentum or trend following system will tend to do well in markets that are trending with low volatility, quiet markets that are just moving in, uh, directionally. For things like mean reverse systems, for example, they tend to do better in more volatile environments where they're mar- the market's swinging around a lot more. Uh, and and you know, and then you might get people who trade things like option strategies who want a very quiet market that doesn't move up or down very much. Mm-hmm. And if if you, you know if you're doing things like condors and butterflies, you want you want the market to just settle in one spot. So, 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 if you if you look at any strategy, regardless of what it is, you will find that it, its results wax and wane. They will, you know, it will profit during some times. It will have drawdowns during others, or it will it will have you know very little return. And then it will its returns will expand. And so, so re- returns in a strategy are just like a market. Uh, but what you want to do is you want to make sure that you deploy that strategy in the in the market conditions that are optimal for that strategy and one way to do that is by having a, some sort of market regime filtering in the strategy itself mm, okay so you just touched upon uh, performance as being one of the major benefits there but can you be a little bit more specific about um, the impacts that you've personally found market regimes can have on your own trading performance yeah absolutely so if if you're trading a trending system and let's just say you know you're going long the s p five hundred for example it's some you know on a breakout let's just say if you if you're just holding that that uh, position you know you're you're gonna be incurring some large swings in your equity and you know something like a two thousand eight type episode comes along and you have you know the market selling down fifty five fifty six percent so that's the sort of protection you want to um to to guard against with with uh, using market regime mm-hmm. um 
and and that's just something that I've generally found is that you maybe you don't want to turn the, the strategies on and off as such, depending on the market regime. But you may you may uh, have some nuances in there. For example, you might decide that you want to use a, a lower position size when the market conditions are more adverse, or you know you want to uh, take less positions or or something of that nature. So so the, the, in, in my experience, you know, having some sort of idea of market regime built into the algorithm uh, will tend to to make the the strategy perform a bit much better and give uh, let's uh, i guess that the the um the thing that we're always trying to target of course is is low volatility of returns you know everybody wants a, a smooth steady rising equity curve mm -hmm. so one one way we can do that is by having a market regime filter which will which will pr basically protect the downside and enhance the upside of of your strategy yeah. So when you just said then that you you want to build it into the strategy, at what part of the strategy development process do you actually include it? Like, do you do you think about a regime and then build a strategy for that, or do you try and um, add the regime later to see what kind of impact it has? <sighs> Uh, you can you do it one of two ways, really. You can you can build. Um, for example, if you're if let's let's take a, a rotational uh, strategy, which uh, which we spoke about on the the last uh, time I was on the show. If, if you have a rotational strategy, the, the, when you come to de uh, develop that rotational strategy, you can have one of the inputs as a market regime filter before you get to the point where you're building the scoring algorithm to to score the the stock the momentum of the stocks themselves. So so you can have it at the very early stage and you can also add it later as well so for example a, sh a short term system that's uh, that's say a mean reverting system is only holding for a short period it may not need a market wide filter because it does well in most market conditions but it may need an instrument specific market filter so you for example you may not want to be buying dips in a stock which is hammering down at a fast rate so so de so depending on the the type of strategy will will we'll sort of influence where in the process you put it in but uh, but yeah you you gen you can generally put it in at the start or you can add it later but you you want to have it in during the development phase you know before, while you're still in the in sample period testing part Okay, so that's a, a really good explanation of why market regimes are important and the impacts it can have on your trading performance. So let's move now to the how. How do you, how do you detect market regimes? Because I know there's, um, there's probably quite a few uh, different techniques that you can use. Some are well publicized and some perhaps not. So yeah. uh, can you give us an indication of some of the techniques um, that you can use for, to detect market regimes? Absolutely, yeah. So they they probably fall into a number of categories, and and it also depends on what what is it that you what what elements of the market is it that you're trying to mark, uh, measure the market regime over. So you could you can so for example, if you're if you're trading the stock market, you might want you might want some sort of market wide filter, or you might want some filter that uh, to gives you an idea of what the index of the stock market is doing, or you might want something that's an instrument specific on the stock itself. Uh, same. You know, if you're if you're trading FX, you might just want something on the FX pair you're interested in, or you might want uh, you know something on uh, you know a basket of commodities if you're interested in that. So so depending on the market you're you're doing you're you're interested in, that you will you'll probably want to try a few different approaches. So you can you can use traditional price based indicators and we'll you know we can t t drill down into what that means yeah. so that would be a market or an instrument specific uh, uh, market regime filter and then you could look more widely at an index for example or some sort of price based in uh, indicator on the index you can look at uh, other things like uh, market breadth so th so looking at the the constituent elements within an index so think of you know the stocks within uh, the S&P 500 for example how are they how are they doing you know individually and then and then uh, and in aggregate uh, and then thirdly there's uh, what i would call intermarket analysis where you're using uh, other markets which are either correlated or anti-correlated with the market you're trading to give you some uh, if you like leading indicator about what your uh, the market you're interested in is is going to do yeah sure okay so let's drill down into each one of those a little bit more um so the first one that you mentioned was indicators which is uh, often a favorite of many traders so what are some mm. good indicators that that we can use to test uh, market regimes 
Yeah. Okay. So when it comes to uh, choosing an indicator on uh, to to tr- to lay, overlay onto a single market or onto an index, there there's there's a number of properties that that I would say make you know will will allow you to target particular uh, indicators. So so in general, you know, we're looking for something that's going to give us a, a a state or a binary outcome, if you like. Is the market bullish or bearish? Is the market volatile or non volatile? So so in other words, we're looking for some sort of oscillator, something that you. Know, will be you know either just give us a positive or a negative result so some sort of oscillator and then when it comes to with using oscillators there's a uh, there, there's a balance that you have to strike between w- w- what I would call reactivity and stability. And if we take the example of, you know, quite widely used example of just a moving average and the price itself, you know, the index and the 200-day moving average is, is a common uh, 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 common uh, use of a market regime that's used by even a lot of professionals in the industry. So, so if you imagine that you're using a 200-day moving average, when the when the bull market does come, you know, you're you're going to give back quite a lot before your market regime filter turns off because it's a long way down to the 200-day moving average. But by the same token, you're only going to get a few signals. So it's going to be a very stable indicator, but it's going to be it's going to have less reactivity. If you push that moving average far closer to the price action and made it much shorter, you know, a 20 or a 10-day moving average, you're going to end up with something that's much more reactive. It's going to get you out very close to the top of the bull market. It's going to get you uh, uh, get you back in at the, at the recovery of the bottom of the bear market. But you're going to get lots of false positive signals when the as the market slices through and reverts back to the main trend. So you're going to introduce turnover into your system. So, so trying to find that balance between stability and reactivity is is the challenge uh, so yeah we want to minimize those false positives and minimize the turnover in the system and 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 let the last point i would say is that you want to find something which is simple you know remember this is this is not the thing that's going to make the money this is just a single thing to keep you on the right side of the market or in the right market conditions so so i would you say that you know the kiss kiss keep it simple stupid acronym definitely applies here um, so some examples of uh, of indicators we could use. Obviously, I've mentioned that just the price and the moving average. That's that's a very easy one to try and to test because you just there's only one parameter. You just adjust the length of the moving average and find out you know where where that best um, uh, that that best. Uh, balance between reactivity and stability is. Uh, you could also try using uh, two moving averages, so dual moving averages. So here, so the, the price itself is obviously a very noisy indicator. If you just in, and if you smooth that by making it into a second moving average, you're going to get far fewer signals. So you're going to get more stable outcomes, but you might pay for that in, in the reactivity because of the lag. So that's that's something mm-hmm. to try and compare with just the price and the moving average. And then there's your traditional kind of price based indicators the ones we all know and love and grew up with you know things like the macd the rsi which will you know they will they will oscillate a lot uh, across the center line and you know something like the macd is just two emas behind the scenes anyway so Mm. so so that has a smoothness to it and so if you just use the you know the indicator and the center line so for the macd that would be the zero line or for the rsi that would be the 50 the 50 uh, line halfway between zero and 100 and you know you're you're you know, you're bullish above that line, you're bearish below. Of course, if you're doing it on something like an index, you'll have to use a much longer period than than the default parameter set that comes with these indicators are. So, yeah. so test a wide range of parameters for these things. Yeah, okay. So earlier you mentioned that there were um, basically six different types of market or broad market conditions. You've got uh, bullish and bearish, volatile and quiet and trending and non-trending. So are you implying that you should have an indicator that, it kind of gives you a binary answer for each of these um, different states or do you find that there's indicators that can, can kind of give you a, a broad um, idea of the states there? Yeah, it's it, it's a tough one. That I mean, you you there are there are some indicators which attempt to to capture those things. Uh, you know, you can think of something like ATR, which will tell you if the market's volatile or calm. Um, uh, trending and not trending is 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 a tricky one. But again, you mm-hmm. could use something like a momentum indicator, a rate of change. You know, when that's close to a zero line, that's a quiet period. When it's far away from a zero line, either above or below, that's that's uh, that's very um, that's an, that's in a trending nature. Some Something like Wells Welder's ADX is another one to look at as well. That can often give you an idea of the market's trending or non-trending. Yeah. Uh, but what you, what you'll tend to find is if you go again, you 
you know, trying to keep it simple, uh, what you'll tend to find is that, you know, when the market is bullish, it will tend to be uh, calm and probably trending. And when the market's bearish, it will tend to be volatile and, you know, and, and also trending to the downside. And then, you know, and then when the market's non-trending, it will tend to be calm. So they, they kind of overlap each other, if you like. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now you made an interesting point earlier about um, when you're using oscillators, you you obviously want to um, uh, you want to extend the default periods to because you're looking at a longer time frame. But what if you're looking at kind of like uh, intraday trading and you maybe you're not really interested in a, a 200 moving average on a you know on a daily chart? So how, how do you adjust those to depending on the time frame that you trade? So I think with the well with intraday it's it's you, you even if you're trading intraday you'll want to have some idea of what the what the wider market conditions are because you know you, your intraday trades are not in um, isolation you know they 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 probably depend on the on the on the selling you know, on the daily trend perhaps even on the weekly trend so if you have some sort of idea from your market regime about what state the market's in overall that mm-hmm. may uh, help you decide you know whether you know you're going to be trading a very small range or you're going to try and capture a much bigger range um you, there's also things you can do which look at you know the 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 recent market conditions if you look at the the, the daily bars you know are the daily bars contracting which might give you a clue that the market's about to expand or are the market as the mar has the market been through an ex- period of expansion which then means that perhaps the intraday time frame is perhaps going to be more contracting so mm-hmm. so those are the sorts of things you could look at there are some intraday measurements that uh intraday day traders use things like the trin and the tick uh which are uh, uh, new york stock exchange based measurements uh, so they are but but they're they're quite volatile you know and and they you you kind of you really have to know how how to use them a lot of traders uh, just uh, think it has to be an, an extreme and then you just you know fade that that move but <laughs> There's, it's actually a little bit more nuanced uh, than that. So, so these, uh, yeah. So, so there, there are some intraday ones, but I think in general you would also want to have a, a broader view as well. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, I think the second category that you mentioned uh, for detecting market regime is was market breadth. So, you just mentioned trend and, and tick there, but do, are there are some other good market breadth measures that you can try. There are, yeah. There's a number of them. And so, w- when we talk about market breadth, what we're what we're mean what we mean is that we're measuring something about the behavior of the individual constituents of an index or a broad market and then we're aggregating them to give us some idea of what's going on so one example of that is just simply measuring the the number of stocks or the percentage of stocks in the index that are above or below their 200 day moving average so 200 as we've spoken about 200 days moving average is typically a a point of equilibrium that's very popular so if a stock is above that that gives you some idea it's bullish if it's below it's 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 you know like it's likely not bullish so if you if you sum up all the stocks that that are in in either one of those states and then express it as a percentage you can you can develop that into to basically an indicator that will give you an idea of the overall market breadth. So typically, you know, measurements when the when this when the stocks above 200 day moving average is above say 70%, that tells you you're in a very bullish market. There's 70% of stocks that are lifting the index higher. So that's a, that's a very bullish sign and and obviously conversely if it's only down at, you know, below 30%, then that's giving you an idea that you're you're in a very risky environment. Uh, the, the there's a couple of others that I'll mention. Uh, the bullish percent index is another. That's that's a uh, just as it sounds. It's the it's the it, the percentage of uh, stocks that are bullish uh, any one time, and it actually uses a point and figure measurement behind the scenes. So it is quite a logical test. It's not uh, it's not subjective. Uh, and there's things like the advanced decline line, new uh, 52 week highs, uh, and you, there's even 52 week highs minus 52 week lows, which give you some some sort of market. Breadth uh, type of indication as well. the The thing about these market breadth tools, of course, is that they're not great timing tools. Mm-hmm. They can diverge from the market for for quite a long time, and when I say quite a long time, I mean many months before the the market actually reacts. So, what you'll generally get out of the bottom of a a, a bear market or a large correction is that you'll get a push up, which will elevate all these market breadth indicators. And then, as the market continues to rise, these uh, the market breadth will will um, will will erode over time. So, it will look as though there's a divergence with the market breadth getting narrower. And 
in other words, the market getting thinner at the top. But it might take a lot, a long, long time, like I said, many months before you finally get a reaction. So, so typically, if you're going to use market breadth, you would want to probably use you would use it as a um, as an early indication, if you like, and then you would have something else, some other trending type tool to make sure you were still on the right side of the market when the when the the divergence was was looking at its maximum because that tells you risk is elevated in the market okay so i guess when you're looking at market breadth um some of those uh, indicators are kind of giving you an idea of the underlying conditions in the market whereas if you're just looking at the price of the index you're looking at the overall sum of you know, of all the movement so you've just mentioned there that one of the disadvantages of um market breadth is that it can be slow in um, giving timing signals but what about some advantages that you can get by using market breadth measures? Well, I think the, the good thing about market breadth, of course, is it is giving you, a, 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 like you say, it's an insight into what's happening underlying the market. So you're you're seeing what's what's going on under the hood or under the bonnet, if you like. You know, rather than relying on just the price of the index, which is obviously just influenced by the price of the stocks. And the other thing about indexes that you have to remember is that they're they're market cap driven. So so there's a few large cap stocks which are generally driving the price of the index, and it doesn't really reflect what's going on to the broad market of stocks underneath. So, so, um, so using market breadth does give you an insight into that, and it can often give you, like I said, some sort of early warning uh, signal that uh, that things are, you know, uh, either up or not up. And they, you know, you can also use them on a, on a very short term basis. You know, I've seen some people use them. If you do things like the the percentage of stocks below their five uh, below five below ten on the on a very short moving RSI, for example, that will give you a very indication when the market market is deeply oversold, and so that at that point you can you know you can either you know you might have a system that, that looks for a reversion at that point in the index. So so they so they are they are they're quite versatile and and they they give you a, a I guess a glimpse behind the scenes and show you some uh, what's going on with the market in terms rather than just having to rely on the price of the index. Yeah, okay. So with some of those market breadth measures that you mentioned, um, I guess it depends where you trade and what your trading platform is, but some of those um, uh, measures aren't readily available. <laughs> so what can you do if you don't have that, that data available in, in your platform? Are there other places that you can go to get that kind of um, information? Yeah, absolutely. So you can create it yourself. I mean, if you have if you have a, uh, any sort of strategy development tool, and and there are many of them, and you've got access to the stock data, then you can calculate calculate it yourself, and you can build up a, a composite or a or a, some sort of uh, uh, indicator, if you like, that sums all the the stocks up for for whichever measurement that you're looking into. So that's that's the I guess the the gold standard because then you you know you're not relying on any any third party for it. But if you if you wanted to get it from somewhere else, there are a couple of things. There's uh, stockcharts.com. I've got a great uh, a list of them. And if you look, if you Google something like stock charts market summary, you'll find uh, uh, their, their listing of, of all the uh, global markets. And down towards the bottom of that list, they have a they have quite a, you know a, a fifteen or twenty of these uh, market breadth indicators. So you can look just on a daily basis and see what the market breadth is doing, and then you could compare that to the the stock index itself. Uh, if you wanted to pull the data in you could try looking at something like uh, quandle.com which uh, which is a free repository of financial market data yep. and a lot of uh, system development and uh, you know um, uh, back testing software now has you know plugins which will pull data directly from that so that's that's something else you could do yeah okay cool all right thanks for that alan now let's move on to the third category, which was intermarket analysis, which touches on the um, your IFTA presentation in Sydney. So, um, what can you tell us about using intermarket measures for um, detecting market regimes? Yeah. So, what we're looking for here when we're talking about intermarket, we're talking about markets that are related to the market that you want to trade. Uh, or that give you some idea of uh, market-wide sentiment, for example. So if you think of something like, you know, uh, the U.S. dollar and commodities, they will tend to be inversely correlated. So you could, if you're if you're trading gold, for example, you can watch the U.S. dollar and and find out what it's doing, and that will give you some idea of the the market regime that you're in. There are, uh, the, if you, if we're talking about the stock market, we could look at uh, something like the bond market. So the bond market 
tends to be quite a good leading indicator of what the stock market uh, or what state the stock market's in, shall we say, whether whether it's in a high risk environment or a low risk environment. And we can look for something like the yield curve. So uh, for for listeners that aren't familiar with the yield curve, the yield curve is basically uh, a, a curve which describes the relationship between um, interest rates on uh, bonds of uh, treasury bonds that is of different expiries. So you have very short term uh, expiries out to very long term uh, expiries. And generally, the shape that we would expect that in their not under normal conditions is a is a slope, which uh, looks you know, low on the left, high on the right. In other words, you know, you, the return on very short term bonds is low compared to if you keep your deposit on for many years, then you're you're going to get um, accrue a much better interest rate. And that that generally tells us that the market is in bull, you know, is, is generally in bull market conditions, the stock market that is. Uh, but then what, what tends to happen is we get towards the top of bull markets. So if, if you look back, things like 2000, 2007, you'll find that the yield curve actually flattens out. So in other words, the short term interest rates of uh, bonds start to rise to meet the, the interest rates that are given for long term interest rates. And you end up with a flattening curve. And that's generally a sign that market uh, risk is elevated. Uh, that also does things like like squeeze bank rates because they, you know, they borrow short term, long um, uh, loan long term, so their rates start getting squeezed, and that generally will will precipitate a rotation out of stocks and into the bond market to capture that yield, and that's what generally kicks off things like a bull market. Again, it's not a great timing tool uh, because you know if you if you look back at what it's done in the past, it can it can it can flatten out you know eighteen months or two years before they actually get to the top of the market. So again, if you were going to use that, you would want to use it in combination with some trending tool. So you would in a low risk environment, you might not have your trending tool and you would just think you know you'd be all in. Um, but when the when the yield curve starts flattening, you might decide, okay, I'm going to add a trending tool now to give make sure I'm on the right side of the market. So so that's one thing. And there there are indexes available that that are continuous, which describe these uh, various interest rates. So so you can build a, an indicator quite easily for it. Again, if you if you Google uh, stock charts uh, dynamic yield curve, they've got a very nice interactive. Thing on their website where you can click anywhere on the S and P 500, and it will show you the shape of the yield curve at that time. So that will get you a, give you a feel for how it changes uh, in real well, not in real time, but in in over history um, as the as the stock market changed. So that's 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 bonds. So looking at bonds to try and trade stocks. Um, Again, on the stock market, we can also look at things like sentiment indicators. So the obvious one for that, of course, is the VIX. You know, when the when the VIX is elevated, that will ten, generally tell us that the stock market is falling. And when the VIX is very low, that will tell us that we're in a in a low, you know generally low volatility bull market. The the uh, the the VIX will tend to move in 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 three. You know, it's it's a mean reverting index of in itself, and it will tend to move in what I call three zones. So you have a, a low risk zone below about, you know, the low 20s, and then you have a elevated risk zone between the uh, low 20s and maybe about 40-ish. And then if it's above 40, that's generally high risk. And we, we don't see that too often, apart from things like uh, 2008, um, of course. Uh, Another one to look at is the put call ratio, which so that that basically measures the, the ratio of puts uh, put contracts to calls in the market. And so when people are more bullish about the stock market, they will generally buy more calls and that will make that ratio drop. And when people are more bearish about the stock market, they'll generally buy more puts and that will make that ratio rise. So it works inverse to the, the, the stock market itself. But what's interesting about the put call ratio is that at the extremes are, is often a turning point in the market. So if you wait for that ratio to get an either extreme high that will tell you you're close to a low in the market or an extreme low which will tell you you're coming near to, to a top in the market mm -hmm. uh, again it's not perfect with timing but it will give you that early warning to to know that you are in you know in that zone and then of course you can use other tools to to try and time the entry a little bit better yeah okay so if we can just jump back to the yield curve uh for a minute it, just say, for example, I'm a stock trader or an ETF trader, and I have no access to the to the bond markets or the the yield curve. Is there a, a way that I can get access to that data, um, or is there some other way I can get access to that data? Yep. Again, you could you could have a look at Quandle.com. There will be probably indexes on there. Um, 
I'm, I'm guessing this because I, I, I haven't been there directly myself. I, I actually uh, I use a data feed from premium data, and in the premium data data feed, they have uh, continuous indexes for the one year, two year, five year, ten year, and thirty year. I think bonds. So you can mm. you can take any combination of them or, or multiples of them, and then uh, just subtract one from the other. So you, if you if you took the ten from the the ten year yield from the two-year yield that will that would give you the differential between the two and that would describe the state of that yield curve so when there's very little difference between the 10 and the two-year that's telling you the yield curve is very flat risk is elevated in the stock market if the if the differential is very large then that's telling you that the yield curve is steep and risk is low in the stock market and generally you're in a bull market at that point yeah. It's very it's it's easier doing that if you can get the hold of that data because then you can have it over a long period to allow you to do things like a back test and and so on. Whereas if you have to construct it from the individual bonds and keep track of all their expiries, it just becomes a, a you know just a, a, a data processing nightmare basically. Mm, yeah. Okay. And what about if we're um, if we're trading other markets, say the Australian market? Does the VIX, um, which is based on the US markets, does do you find that still applies to the Australian markets or not? Well, you know, a lot of stock markets are generally correlated, and you know, we you, you will see, you know, if there's a large sell-off in the U.S. markets, that generally goes around the world. So, so you can use it to an extent um, yep. for that. However, there there is an Australian VIX as well, so you, you can get access to that, and that will give you the the, the VIX numbers for the local market as well. Uh, but yeah, you, I, I found that it it's generally a good indication. Uh, and remember, it's just one tool. It's not it's not, not what you're trading. It's just an input. Uh, but it, it does on its own give you a, a very good idea of where, uh, let's say, global stock markets in general are in, in the risk profile. Okay. And what about the yield curve then? Is it better to um, to look at the, the bond market in your local stock market or um, do you find that it's a, it's a similar kind of thing with the US markets? <laughs> Yeah, I guess the same same sort of thing. You can if you get. I mean, a lot of these things are down to what data can we get a hold of, you know. And and the the US is just you know great for getting a hold of of data of, of all kinds, and and a lot of it is you know free and readily available. Uh, it's a little bit tricky sometimes to get you know bond yields for you know individual markets uh, especially some of the more obscure markets that you might want to trade. So, and yeah, d- depending on how the how correlated or anti-correlated the stock, the local stock market is with the bond yields uh, um, is it, is an open question as well. It's something you would have mm. to test because there are often you know uh, country specific uh, economic factors which are playing into to you know what's happening with bond rates and so on, which are also linked to you know foreign exchange and and a whole pile of other things. So it's you know with all of this stuff, it's worthwhile testing everything and just seeing what works the best for you. Yeah, okay, great. All right, well, um, before we start wrapping up, I'd, as I mentioned at the start of our chat that you uh, presented at the IFTA conference, and um, we've we've kind of discussed a, a few of the points that you mentioned, especially in the intermarket measures um, section there, but did, did you want to give a, a, a brief summary of what your research found and what you presented at that conference so uh, everyone can enjoy the uh, the fine research that you did? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's uh, yeah, it's, it's it was something an, an idea that that I presented, which which I thought was 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 something that's fairly novel to a lot of traders, and you know, something that that I've only been aware of for a year or two now. And it looks at the the VIX futures term structure actually. So so the the VIX itself. Uh, is just an index. You can't actually trade it, but if you want to get exposure to it, you can buy and sell futures contracts. So there's the, the VIX has a, a term structure, which which is the the various prices of the VIX uh, futures going out, you know, from the front month to the back month to the third and fourth and so on. And one one thing that uh, that I discovered, uh, and again, it's it's I, I discovered this of somebody else's research, so I was kind of piggybacking off what they had done. But the the 
depending on the state of the fixed ter- futures term structure, which which can flip from so-called contango, which is when when the the front month is very uh, cheap compared to the the, the future months, uh, to what's called backwardation, which is when the the front month is more expensive uh, compared to the back months. And so what what tends to happen is people will hedge their stock portfolios by buying and selling uh, VIX futures. And when 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 investors are uh, more worried about volatility now, they they will tend to buy into short term VIX futures, which elevates the price of the VIX futures, and then vice versa when they're less worried about volatility now, but perhaps more worried about volatility in the future, they will they will sell down their their near term hedge and they will hedge a bit further out. Um, but what's interesting is when the when that when that uh, line flips from uh, from backwardation to contango, that often describes uh, low points in the stock market, and so you know it, it's actually can be quite a good timing tool. Um, and obviously, you know, it's you would have to use some sort of market regime filter to make sure that you're buying, you know, the dip in the stock market and during. Uh, s- Times when the market is 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 more likely to revert to the upside, uh, so but but it's it's quite a good timing tool. And um, if you want to get a feel for it, there's a there's a website called VixCentral.com, and if you have a look at that, that will that gives you that will show you the VIX term structure, and you can again you can um, you can plug in various dates, and it will it will show you what the states are. So so go back and have a look at uh, some uh, lows in the stock market, and then have a look at what the the term structure is doing either side of that and that will give you a, a feel for how that can do and again there's a there's a couple of indexes which describe this on a, on a continuous basis uh, vix obviously being the 30 day uh, implied volatility expectation and there's then then there's various other ones one being v- vxv which is the 90 day uh, expected uh, implied volatility so so if you look at a ratio of those two again that can give you an indicator which will um, which which can be used as a timing tool so yeah, okay. All right, thanks for sharing that, Alan. Mm-hmm. Now, you've mentioned um, quite a lot of ideas for market regime in our chat today. What do you recommend for someone who's just starting out? Where should they begin? Well, I would say begin with something very simple and just use the, the you know, the price of whatever it is you're trading and a long-term moving average. So, you know, if you're trading stocks, if you if you if you want to trade a stock on the long side, then make sure that it's always above a long-term moving average. And what moving average you use, again, will will de- come down to to some sort of testing and optimization process and it, like mm-hmm. i said try a wa- as wide a range as possible uh, with your strategy so if you're if you have something that's buying breakouts for example then put a moving average on the on the in, on the uh, on the the instrument that you're trading and test it over a wide range of look back periods and then see what gives you the best results for when you should be getting long that that instrument or not so that's that's where i would start and then you know the the next one from there would probably be to look at some sort of indicators and again you know we're thinking oscillators here so stochastics um rsi macd there there's tons of them you know there's literally hundreds mm. of them out there so so that would be a good spot to start and and again if you're looking at these price based indicators use them over a, a, a much longer look back period than you would traditionally use and when we think of something like the rsi as being a short term oscillating uh, um, indicator but if you actually put it on a much longer period like 100 or 200 days what you'll find is it, it gives you a much more uh, it's much more momentum based if you like and it will give you a bit more of an indication of where the market's uh, going on a longer term basis yeah so what if you have a limited amount of data so if you're if you're testing this stuff over an in sample period you may only have a couple of years worth of data and if you're looking at a uh, testing a 200 day moving average you probably won't get many uh, instances so if you've got limited data how do you go about deciding uh, what could be an appropriate uh, measure to use uh well i would caution against doing any sort of strategy development with limited data because you're going to suffer from issues with small sample size uh you know you are probably overfitting because of the the, the lack of um, um a decent sample to test over so yeah if possible i would say go, go and get more data on it on any market that you're thinking of trading i mean if if I would, I would be very uh, reticent about trading anything that only had a couple of years' data on it. So yeah, I, you know, get five years maybe okay, ten years ideally, uh, but try and try and get as much as you can. And, and you know, for for most 
you know, widely traded instruments, that's that sort of level of data is, is easy to come by these days. Again, shout out to Premium Data because they've got some uh, very good data products for, um, for that, that sort of time scale. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so, what about for the more experienced trader? Do you have any resources that you can you can uh, recommend that people look at, perhaps books or um, or websites? Uh, yeah. Well, well, again, I'll come back to the, the works of Howard Bandy because he's uh, you know not not only has he got some very uh, uh, really good books on on getting started in in the quantitative uh, trading system space. In fact, these one of his early works is actually called Quantitative Trading Systems. That was kind of the book that that I always uh, um, cite as, as the one that sort of got me going and, and turned me into a consistently profitable trader. So so start there. He's also, uh, he's got some more advanced works. The his, One of his latest books is called uh, Quantitative Technical Analysis. And that's a very good book, uh, which, uh, you know, looks at, goes, goes in depth into indicator-based um, uh, trading and also uh, goes into more sort of machine learning approaches and so on as well. Um, so anything by Howard Bandy, I, I think, is 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 a really good place. Now, and if you're really just getting going, he's actually got a new book out called Foundations of Trading. I think is the, is the name, yep. and that's uh, that's 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 a really sort of good overview of all these other works. So you can use that as a as a beginner's guide if you like, and then you can dip into to the, these other works for more detail. Yeah. Yep. Okay, cool. All right. Thanks, Alan. So we usually wrap up with a few quick closing questions, but you've done this before in um, in the previous episode. So I might just uh, <laughs> ask you a, a, a general question on, uh, do you have any advice for traders? <sighs> Yeah, I guess the, I mean, the, the main one that I always keep coming back to is, is patience, uh, you know, and, and uh, some somebody sort of said this to me once, you know, that, you know, with all trading, you, you'd have to have patience. I mean, we, we can all get sucked into recency bias and, and looking at, you know, the, the res, you know, the individual results of any strategy, but it's really not until you've traded any strategy for a year, two years, three years, I think that you can really say whether it's working or it's not working. I mean, all, like we said at the top, all strategies go through bad periods and good periods. And so not only do you need patience to trade things on an individual trade basis, but I think you also need patience to to wait and allow strategies to to develop before you uh, you know move on to the next thing or or decide to to make changes to it. Yep, good piece of advice there, Alan. So thank you. Now um thanks a lot for your time today. Um was there anything else that you wanted to mention before we finish up? <sighs> Uh, no, that's it. I guess, you know, if, if anybody wants to get in touch, I'm happy to hear from them and answer any questions on the stuff we've discussed or anything else. Uh, I guess my uh, my website is helixtrader.com. I'm on Twitter as well at Helix Trader. Uh, and, you know, feel free to, to drop me an email at alan at uh, helixtrader.com. And uh, yeah, yeah, I'm always uh, happy to chat with fellow traders. Yeah, cool. All right, I'll have links to those um, to those pages on my website so that people can find those easily. All right, so thanks again for spending time with, with us today, Alan, um, sharing your uh, lots of insights into market regimes and market filters. So you've, I think you've just given us all loads more ideas to test. So add those to the ever-growing list. <laughs> but <laughs> thanks again, and uh, I wish you all the best. Thanks a lot, Andrew. It's a pleasure to be back on the show. Thanks. All right, cheers. Bye. Okay, so a huge thanks goes out to Alan for coming back on the show to discuss market regimes with us. Alan shared loads of great ideas for market regime today, some which I have tried and some which I actually use in my own trading, and also quite a few that I haven't had to, the chance to check out yet. And I'm interested to hear what you think. Do you use market filters in your own trading? And if so, which ones have you found to be the most effective? And if you don't, what was your favorite tip from the episode today? Join the conversation by leaving a comment at the bottom of the show notes page at bettersystemtrader.com slash 63. I'm interested to hear your thoughts. If you'd like to get some more information on anything that was mentioned in this episode, or if you have a question, then you can also get that from the show notes page as well, bettersystemtrader.com slash 63. We have links to resources and also you can download a transcript as well if you'd like a written copy of what we discussed today. Also, if you're enjoying the podcast here, please show your support by leaving a quick, honest rating and review for the show over on iTunes. It's really a huge help and it only takes about 30 seconds to do. So just go to iTunes, type in Better System Trader, click on rating and reviews and leave your honest review right there. And a big thanks to you for doing that. Much appreciated. 
If you have a topic you'd like to hear about on the show or a guest you'd love to hear from, feel free to email me, andrew at bettersystemtrader.com or you can just leave a comment on any of the show notes pages for the podcast episodes and let me know what you'd like to hear about or who you'd like to hear from and we'll see what we can do. We have some really great episodes lined up for the rest of this year, so I'm looking forward to sharing those with you. But I will see you again in two weeks' time for the next episode. Thanks for listening to Better System Trader. Thanks for listening to the Better System Trader podcast. The next step is to head over to bettersystemtrader.com for more expert tips, practical advice, and exclusive content. Catch us next time for even more great ways to improve your trading here on Better System Trader. Better System Trader.